right. So we are concluding our May series, Handcrafted, this morning. And we've been uh, looking at how God takes nothing special and makes it something great. So if you're just joining us, you haven't been through the rest of the series, we've been looking at Jeremiah's experience um, at the potter's house and when God showed him while he was there. So, so far we've learned that the potter is actually God. We learned that people are the clay. And the wheel of God's will and circumstances spins while God shapes them by his hands to be new vessels created in Christ Jesus. So there's a lot happening here in this simple metaphor uh, that we see at the potter's house. Now, I want to bring your attention to a new feature. Everybody say new. All right, this is new. Uh, now, you guys may have not noticed this when you picked up your bulletin, but now there is a place for you to write sermon notes. And uh, this, this is something that has been requested from time to time that they would like a place to be able to write notes. Uh, and so this has a place for you to do that. Now, these notes, I've noticed when the years I've done them, because I used to do them all the time. They actually used to give you fill in the blanks and everything and kind of do most of the work for you. But what I've noticed is that when I would go visit people, they would have these on their refrigerators. They would have them in their Bibles. And then they would also give them to somebody who wasn't able to come to church. And maybe they're listening online or, or maybe it just really fit. That sermon fit with that person's need. And so these are uh, both for you to, um, to remember what was said, but also as a track that you could use to evangelize to share someone uh, some truths that you learned from that Sunday. Now, that's my plug. I'm not going to be talking about that every week, but I wanted to at least bring your attention to that new feature. Now, today for Memorial Day, I have a message that I planned a while ago, but I think it just has applications today. And it's always hard as a pastor to know how to speak when things happen in our culture, and you feel like you have to talk about, if you talk about one, you got to talk about them all. And so today, I'm going to leave the message as it is. As God has given it to me, I'm going to give it to you. I think it'll be something that'll benefit you. And I think the title is appropriate. It's called Vessel of Honor. Vessel of Honor. So if you have your Bibles, we're going to be at Jeremiah 18, and we're going to look at the first four verses. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will let you hear my words. So I went down to the potter's house, and there he was working at his wheel. And the vessel he was making of clay was spoiled in the, in the potter's hand. And he reworked it into another vessel, as it seemed good to the potter to do. Now, according to Jeremiah, the potter forms the vessel as it seemed good to the potter to do. Now, this sounds great until you realize that you have no choice or very limited choice in what you are or what you will become. There's a lot going on that you think you have control over, and yes, you do, but God ultimately has choice, or we call it sovereignty in a theological language. He is over it all, and amen for that. Amen for that. Someone's in charge. Now, when we say no choice, you're like, that can't be right, can it? Well, Romans 9, if you go to the New Testament, we see a couple of verses that talk about this. It says, but who are you, O man, to answer back to God? Will what is molded say to its molder, why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? Good question. Does God have sovereignty if we have free will? Can there be both? Well, People are vessels, we know that, and they're formed and shaped by the potter. That is where we're working today. So I want to give you a couple characteristics of vessels to begin. Now, vessels are first, they come in various shapes, sizes, and services. Let's just look around in the room. Notice we look different. We have different shapes. We have different sizes. Uh, and... We have different occupations, services, things we like, things we do. Now, in the Bible, we see this with Goliath, a giant, and we see Zacchaeus, a wee little man. 
We see kings and peasants. We see rich and poor. Not everybody is given the same in their life, in their situation. Just like vessels, they come different. Secondly, vessels are containers. Now, containers, think about that. Containers contain. Their purpose is to carry or hold substances. Now, in the Bible, we think of the woman with very valuable perfume, and she broke that at Jesus' feet and began wiping his feet with her hair and tears and anointing his feet. Very valuable that were the contents in that container. But we also see in different containers, water would maybe be put in this, but when they were washing their feet in the Bible, that water got pretty gross. So not everything that's contained is so great. We also see with Jesus, his first miracle was turning water in a vessel into wine. He transforms what's within. But there's a purpose in vessels that they carry something. Now, vessels do not have equal value, at least in the marketplace, in other people's eyes, but they're made from the same clay. Pretty amazing. Now, in the Bible, we have a, we have a parable that Jesus told about talents, and each person was given different amounts of value to do what, do what with. But it wasn't how much value that they had, it's what they did with it. In other words, as we would say, it's not the cards you have been dealt, it's, it's how you use them. Okay. Now, vessels have a form and function that are designed by the potter. Okay. So it's what they look like and how they operate. It's by a design, and it's as, as Jeremiah 18.4, as it seemed good to the potter to do, by design. Now, we've talked about several of these aspects of the potter's house, and this morning, I want us to focus in on God's hands. Imagine his hands with me. I mean, how big or, or what they're like. It's going to hold the whole world in his hands, as we sang in children's songs growing up. Now, I want to focus on God's hands specifically in creation and development of making vessels of honor and dishonor. And I'm going to give you three inescapable laws of God's hands in every vessel, and that every vessel has to follow. These are three inescapable laws of God's hands. Now, these are my laws. You can disagree with them, but... As I read it, it makes pretty, pretty good sense here. Now, one of the greatest truths in life, which we all know, but which we all must learn ourselves, is that we cannot escape from God. There's nowhere in creation that you can escape the existence of the Creator. You cannot believe in Him, but that doesn't take you away from Him. Psalms 139.7 says, I can never escape from your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. So to be in God's hands uh, is, is, is to not get away from his presence. Secondly, to be in God's hands is to be in his care. So it's actually something you want. You want to be in his hands because it's to be in his care. Now there's several verses uh, Isaiah says that are really good. Verse 10 of chapter 41 says, Don't be afraid, for I am with you. Don't be discouraged, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will hold you up with my victorious right hand. That's pretty awesome. Uh, 46 verse 4 says, I will be your God throughout your lifetime until your hair is white with age. That may be 39 if you're me. I made you, and I will care for you. I will carry you along and save you. Chapter 49 verse 16, Behold, I have engraved you on the palms of my hand. Your walls are continually before me. So these are the pictures we get of God's hand. It's for uh, we can't escape God, and we cannot escape God's hand of care. Uh, we cannot run. We cannot hide. You know, we can commit atrocious evil and yet not escape God's hand, which for us, it's mostly, if you're a believer, you're a Christian, it's a good thing to be in God's hand. But if you're a vessel of dishonor, Hebrews 10.31 warns us, it is a terrible thing to fall into the hands of the living God. He compares them to a consuming fire. And so woe to that man or that woman that is a vessel of dishonor because that would not be the hands you'd want to fall into. So I'm going to give you guys some laws, three of them to be precise. And these are all, I think, uh, according to Scripture. And I'll try to back that up with Scripture. 
Law number one is that people are designed by God. People are designed by God. You guys, if nod your head if you're in agreement so far. Yeah, I, I see that one. Now, some of you guys are not nodding. I need you to come up to the pulpit and preach for your, your position here. Now, Genesis 2, 7 says, Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostril the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. Now, this is a portrait of the Creator designing mankind from the dust. Now, dust is just a collection of dead material. Things have died and made dust, okay? And then filling this person with the breath of life to contain life, thus making mankind like God in some respect, and that he's a self-generating, perpetual, eternal life. You guys are like, wow, that's big words. Okay, now this is life beginning life. Now, we see this with uh, producing children. And also in the miracle of Elisha, if you turn to 2 Kings chapter 4, you'll notice uh, this widow, this miracle of the oil. You guys know that one where he told her to go get the empty vessels? And the oil just kept pouring from this vessel as many empty vessels that she could get. But it's a picture of God's self-generating life, perpetual life that he can give. So God is the source and he gives that to mankind through the breath of life. Now, Genesis 2-7 is the original design of the vessel. It's a vessel of honor made to carry life. Like vessels are made different, man was also made different from all other living creatures with the same dead material. Now, while these are certainly technological advancements, hold on, let me make sure I'm getting this right. I think this, this fast-forwarded quite a bit. There we go. Now, now, science. Everybody say science. Okay, we're all on the same page. Now, science has given us several observations that confirm mankind's connection with all other living creatures from the Genome Project. I'm not going to get into that, but the leader of that was uh, a Christian uh, who wrote a book about that called The Language of God. And the way he saw it was that all life is connected, and we see that through these living creatures. Now, they've successfully written out the Human Genome DNA Project, which is like 8 billion so characters, probably nothing you're really that interested in, but you're welcome to look into that further. But I guess it was a big feat, because it showed us the DNA strands and all the numbers and all that stuff, and it, and it showed us that life is connected in some way from, to living creatures. Now, don't jump to evolution. Some of you guys are already there, because that's not really what this is confirming. Uh, because both evolution and creation stories uh, of how life began all recount a single source as, as the occurrence of life. Now, one begins with God as the source of life, as the creation story accounts, that uh, the other, though, has like a single burst of life happening from nothing, which if you just follow the logic, it's pretty contradictory because nothing, something cannot come from nothing. But that's kind of the basis of that theory, at least for now. Maybe it'll change. Maybe they'll figure out that God is the source. But that's not what this is confirming. What it does confirm is that the same source of life is found in all living creatures. The same clay or the same breath working in all creation. We have the same life giver to all living creatures. Now, for this reason, known only to God and his will, humans cannot crossbreed with other living creatures. We are made distinct from other creatures. Now, if you look through your Bible, uh, you'll find a really odd instance, because there's only one instance where humans were able to crossbreed with another uh, living creature, and it's found in Genesis 6, 1 verse, through verse 2. It says, when man began to multiply on the face of the land and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of man were attractive, and they took as their wives any they chose. Now, here it's depicting that Mankind was able to create a hybrid human, half, half man and half son of God. And it's this picture that we're given, like, what do you do with that? We're, because if you, if you know anything about anything, humans can't crossbreed with other living creatures. That would be weird. But here we're given that, and right before the flood of this account. Now, we can easily get tripped up on this, exactly who the sons of God were and what this hybrid uh, was like. And that's not exactly the point. It's there because it's showing how corrupted the world had gotten. They were trying to make themselves like God, and this is like the extent they were willing to give up their design for something better in their eyes. 
and we ended up, it just made the world go and corrupt, and the flood came and swept that away. So these verses are here to show us how corrupt humanity had become, that they were not content to be mankind, but they were allowed their daughters to be given so that they could be something more. Now you're like, that's wild. Why would they do that? That's so not like today. But I'm going to make, I'm going to, I'm going to give you guys something to think about. Now, this seems far-fetched, but if you look at modern um, comparisons, it's not so far-fetched. Now, genetic engineering, for example, has developed to a point where they're saying that they can create a human being outside of a woman. They can have their own womb in a lab. I don't know if they've confirmed that or if they've actually done that, but that's where technology is going. They want to do that. They want to take and make babies in a lab. Now that may be like, you know, that's science fiction, that's so not real. Well, it's becoming the, the, the choice of some people. Now, the, through human selection, we see corrupted people may seek to select even certain genetic features and try to turn them on and turn them off. And they're trying to make humanity better so that we can live longer, so that we can be healthier, so that we can solve cancer, whatever the case may be. But it's turning into this, turning to technology to make us more than human, more than what we've been designed. And so this sounds like science fiction, but again, the possibility is here. And we see this scientific advancement uh, has also already started. Some of the things that, you, that you're probably involved in is that if you're on the internet, okay, anybody on the internet here? Um, or social media, okay? These two advancements have radically changed how human beings behave. Internet, for example, gives us access to information so that uh, we can, within a press of a button, I know exactly where I can go, and I'm like a cyborg walking around with this technology. It makes me more than what I was before the Internet was invented. Social media makes us connected in a way where we feel like we're in Texas right now. Okay? It makes us connected with people all over the place. It's no longer just where we live with the people that we meet and talk to. Now you guys are like, this is just advancement. But it's not. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a pursuit to be something more than what we are. And so it's not like these are just bad and you can't use them. I'm telling you, these changes are already happening, and we're just in, in this time where this modern society. Now, I say that because back before the flood and even to now, there is this desire to be more than what we are, to be more than what God has given us to be. Now, God's hands are the only thing keeping humanity here. If he lifted the, the, the atmosphere, the, the ozone layer, we would all be crushed and dead uh, in a matter of seconds. God's hands are literally what is keeping us here. His sovereignty reigns over all creation, and nothing escapes his knowledge and power to determine the course of creation. Now, this is a theological way of saying that God's in charge over human enterprise. And no matter what evil humanity thinks up, God is one step ahead, and he's shaping vessels for honor and dishonor. God is using all of these things that are happening, and we don't need to be living in fear of what's coming next or, what, or if we'll be turned into some cyborgs like Terminator or something like that. Uh, God is overseeing it all, and he will use it ultimately for his purposes. But this is because people are trying to break the law that people are designed by God. Second law is this, that people are shaped by culture. Now, God has made it so that people are shaped by other people and other beliefs and other getting around others. We are shaped by culture. Now, what is culture? The word comes from the Latin word cultus, which means worship. It refers to the beliefs, values, customs, and behavior patterns of a group of people. You can, we have a different culture here, and you go across the United States, there's other cultures. You know, we have cultures everywhere, but it's a group of people that have a shared, uh, shared belief, shared values, and shared uh, patterns. Now, you won't, get, um, you won't get out of life without worshiping something. Uh, you won't get out of life like you aren't affected by culture, because culture is worship, and worship is culture. Worship is something that you get to choose. You get to choose what the object of your worship is going to be, and if it's going to be in this life or something other than God, uh, you will be shaped by that. You will call it something else, but it is what it is. Now, the Old Testament and New Testament spend a great deal talking about false worship. They talk about idols uh, because man wants to make an image in which to worship, to be shaped by that. 
And you can see that by what they form with their hands out of wood, out of clay, what they're willing to put in a shrine and say, this is what my life will be about. And this is what a society will say, this is what we want to worship and be about. Now for us, that may look like money, that may look like sex, that may look for gratification in the world, but these are the things that can shape us. And we have to be alert to say, this is how it works. You live in a place, you will be shaped by them unless there is an object of worship that is higher than anything in this world. Now, without worship of God, we won't know what God's will is, and therefore we'll submit ourselves to the hands of culture and to fashion us according to their beliefs, values, customs, and behavior patterns. And we need to be alerted to that and have discernment to say, is social media changing me? Think about it, the last five years, are you different because of your social media use? Are you more godly, okay? Are you walking closer to the Lord than you have before social media? Before the internet, for you guys that lived long enough, what kind of person were you compared to now? Okay, like these are things you've been shaped, you've been conditioned, and you don't even know it because these are the things that are out there that are affecting you. So we need to be discerning people of knowledge and not, uh, not ignorant of God and how he works and how he's created us to be. Now, when people are ignorant of God, they won't know this is conditioning and that is occurring in their life. They are just going to be shaped. Okay, so Romans 12.2 warns us to do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. The Bible serves as a reality filter that detoxes us from the world's indoctrination. As the world tries to shape us to be like them, the Word of God stands to sober us up and say, so we can see ourselves as people designed by God and we're shaped by culture and we want to be shaped by someone greater. Now this renewal of your mind is a continual work that you do by committing yourself to reading the Bible regularly, studying its meaning for your life, and applying its practical wisdom to every situation you face. You should have the feeling like, I don't know what I'm doing. Because the Word of God is there to, to, to teach you, to inform you. Teachers, pastors, they're there to help to inform you on what the Bible has to say about your situation. Now, what most people don't understand about the Bible is that it's not so much us reading it that is as important. It's that the Bible is reading us. When you're with the Word of God and you're reading it, it's also examining you and helping to correct things. You see, the Holy Spirit is able to correct faulty beliefs and still godly values, convict us of ungodly lifestyles, and change our habits. When you read that God created humans, for example, in Genesis 1.27, you can see what cultural beliefs that it corrects. There's a lot of these things, but I think it's important to take some time today to go through them. You see, in Genesis 1.27, when we see that God created man in his own image, in the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Now, we're created in the image of God. That has implications for how we treat people because they are God-bearers. Okay, they're image bearers. We can't just treat them like dirt or treat them lesser than we are or our friends. There's no grounds for hate based on whether it's race, ethnicity, or differences in lifestyle because no matter how marred we believe that that human being is, at the end of the day, they are, they are image bearers of God's image. And so that's part of what it informs us. But what cultural belief does this verse shed light on? Did you notice that God created a separation between humanity? There are male and there are female. Now, culture is moving away from this, but Scripture doesn't budge on this central distinction between male and female. In fact, Scripture and science observe there are two biological sexes. Science is not going not to not agree with that. There are. There's a reason why they say this is a boy, this is a girl when you're born. And so it's not just for obvious reasons. Genetically, you are a boy or you are a girl by your sex. But it's social construct that's making it further distinctions between genders, and it's causing a lot of confusion. Now, adults are not confused so much about this issue. Some are willing, though, you know, to suspend reality for the sake that that person's chosen this and that you know, they don't feel like they fit between male or female. And you know, people are going to feel different things. They're going to see themselves differently. And you can respect that. You can give them some dignity. But there are confused adults that are wanting to take it a step further, and they're wanting to deconstruct gender altogether. 
uh, to form genders at the, per, at the preference of people rather than God's design for people. And we, so, so we see that adults uh, can be a part of this. Now, adults may not be as confused. They may know these differences, but children are confused on this. Just talk to children about it. Ask them about it. They will, they will give you some confusing messages of what they've heard. They don't know what's true and have been taught that the Bible actually teaches hate when people are teaching them to hate their design. Okay, these, uh, these are things that are being taught, and we need to be able to look at the Word of God and say, well, what does it say about these cultural issues, these cultural beliefs? Now, same-sex lifestyle doesn't produce new life, and this is a big reason why God starts off with making male and females, because it's about reproducing life. It's about life and multiplying, be fruitful and multiply. You can't do that with one and one, okay? So these are things that are, are obvious, but they're not to, to, to people today. Now, if you're a practicing homosexual, the same gospel applies to you as it applies to everyone else. Now, you may prefer that lifestyle, but like everyone else, we must repent. We must turn away from our will and our way and choose to follow Christ. Now, this goes for every lifestyle practiced in our culture that is not designed by God according to the Scripture. I got one amen. I, I should be getting like, amen! You know, what's going on? Why are we so, so shy about that, okay? There are lots of lifestyle the Bible says is sin. It's missing God's design. It's not just about this cultural issue. But if we don't understand what Scripture has to say, we will believe and come to our own conclusions, and it will be misguided. It will miss the point. And so all sin is shown for what it is under the light of Scripture. Okay, when you read Scripture, it, it just illuminates things like it does, like it doesn't, like nothing else. It's, some say the best disinfectant is light, and God's Word sheds that light. Now, people are designed by God, and people are shaped by culture. Okay, and if we don't have this, the Word of God to fight against that or worship, it will create people that are far from Christ and far from God's design. Law number three. Are you guys still with me? All right, because we're going, we're going to start landing here pretty soon. Now, law number three is this. People are signed and sealed by the Lord. People are signed and sealed by the Lord. Every master craftsman or craftswoman seals their work to, so that it endures throughout generations. And then they sign their work with their signature declaring it's their, their, its owner. Say, I did this work. I'm proud of this. They put their name. The same principle applies to people in the Lord's continuous work of sanctification. Now, again, a, a big word, sanctification. If I asked, if that was on a test, would you be able to answer it? You're like, well, maybe if I had two multiple choices, true or false, or maybe if I had four, I'd be able to answer it. Help me, let me help you. Now, sanctification simply means the ongoing cleansing of lifestyle for godly purposes. It's like doing the dishes, okay? The Holy Spirit cleanses a particular part of your lifestyle that is sin. You repent of that sin. He washes you. He holds it. He doesn't, you're not spotted by it. You don't have to remember it. And he can use it for godly purposes. And it's a continual work. I'm not the same person I was when I first believed. God has taken me through a continual work of sanctification. Now, 2 Timothy 2, 19 through 21 gives us uh, the context here. It says, but God's firm foundation stands. Bearing this seal, the Lord knows who are his, and let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. Now in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honorable use, some for dishonorable. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house ready for every good work. Now, the Bible says it right there. I'm going to give you guys a modern-day cultural example uh, that you may have seen or your child has, may, have, may, may have seen. Uh, it's from the movie Toy Story. Now, how many of you guys have seen Toy Story? Talking to a couple people here, a few of you. Now, in the originals, in the 1990s, I think, but uh, in the original Toy Story, and uh, we see a six-year-old. And uh, he inscribes his name on the bottom of the right foot of his favorite toy named Woody. Now, you can tell it's written by a six-year-old because he writes 
the N of his name Andy in, you know, backwards. Now, when Woody feels like he's forgotten and he's been replaced by a newer favorite toy named Buzz, he looks at the bottom of his foot to remind himself of who and whose he is. Uh, he belongs to Andy. We actually see this as a, a, a reoccurring theme of, of looking at the name to remind him of whose he is. Now, Buzz gets this special name written on his foot later on, showing that he too is Andy's favorite. What an honor, two favorite toys. You're my most favorite. But if you have kids, it's kind of like that. You don't really have one favorite. I, my mom always said I'm her favorite youngest son, and I knew what she meant by that. But, as, but you, it is possible to have more favorites when it comes to your kid. And so these honorable toys were given special privileges of going on trips with Andy, uh, where the others were left behind. And I always felt bad for him. Like, why didn't you take all of them? Uh, but there's, there's, there's a reason why, because it's Andy's choice. He gets to choose who his favorites are and who gets left behind. Now, what's interesting about Toy Story is how the plot of the movie uh, is all about Andy moving on from childhood. And these toys are grappling with it being unloved by their original owner, Andy. And we see this by them getting lost or misplaced and trying to find their way back. Well, Andy, he goes off to college, and his toys get donated to a daycare named Sonny's Daycare. Now, talk about abandonment issues with these toys. They're just getting dropped off, and all these random kids are playing with them. Well, the culture, if you, I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but watch the movie again, you'll see it. But the culture at Sunnyside Daycare was a dog-eat-dog -dog kind of world. Okay, toys were separated according to who adopted the cultural practices of the boss, Lotso, and it's, who's a bear with his own abandonment issues, as you learn later on. He's got reasons why he is the way he is. But you'll see it. There's a distinction. There's two rooms. One, you know, and it's like whoever adopts the cultural practices of Lotso gets special treatment by older kids that are more responsible than the newbies. Now, rather than conforming to the culture, Andy's toys break out of the daycare altogether, and they make their way back to Andy. Now, there's a story of loss, redemption, and restoration here that I really, I think, draws a lot of people to these movies. Ultimately, we see Andy, he chooses to give his favorite toys uh, to a new owner named Bonnie, and it's, which is like representative of a new life for these vintage toys. So it's just meant to say these are ongoing uh, things you can pass on. Now, through it all, whether lost, separated, they always carried the name Andy scribbled on their foot. They knew who they belonged to, even if they weren't able to be with their, their owner. See, there's a message written on those who are his. Some believe in an election, Calvinist, of, of so many believers that God pre-chooses who gets saved and the others, you know, by his grace, from damnation. But the others have to also admit, too, that God chooses those that will be sent to damnation and that there's not really a choice that is given to humanity. I think a more sensible view is that God's grace allows us to find salvation through human free choice to choose God and what he's already chosen. You see, God loves you. God's saved you in the sense that God has provided salvation through Christ. But we ultimately get to choose whether or not we're going to accept and follow this salvation, this path. See, once salvation is chosen as a path back home to God, we discover a message has been written on our hearts. The Lord knows who are his. Romans 8.15 says it another way. The spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. Meaning there's something given to you which you naturally cry out to him as the source. You want him. Nothing else will do. And it's a God work inside of you. Now, when you receive salvation, you receive Christ's spirit in your heart. It's a beautiful thing. And it makes you, uh, makes Christ operative in your life. And you can begin to change. Now, if your lifestyle isn't affected by your salvation, then you're not saved. That's my view, and you can take it for what you want, but uh, the fruit of repentance isn't there. I cannot say you're saved. And not, not that I make the judgment call, but people are like that. Your salvation isn't complete if your lifestyle hasn't been affected. It's words with no actions. Now, it goes with everything in, in life. 
but it also goes with salvation. It's not just my words, it's God's words. Acts 11, 18, listen to this. He's, he says, when they heard this, which is the disciples, they, they quieted down and glorified God, saying, well then, God has granted to the salvation he has granted to the Gentiles also the repentance that leads to life. Meaning they were noticing Gentiles, which were not Jews. They didn't know if Gentiles were going to be saved at that point. But when they saw their lifestyles were changed because of what they heard, the good news, they, they were able to say, yes, repentance that leads to life. They've received it. 2 Peter 3.9 says, The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness but is patient towards you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. An interesting choice of word. God wants you to be saved, but repentance is a part of that salvation work. Now, I believe salvation comes first, then repentance, but Christians can only know your salvation by your repentance. Your life has changed. That's how we know. But I believe salvation comes before that. You're not, it's not by works so that nobody can boast. It's by grace what God has given to you. Now, if there's no repentance, no one knows but you and God, which is really convenient to say, yes, I'm a Christian, but my life doesn't show it. Uh, but it testifies to others something else, and we have to consider this. Others are watching you. If you're saying you're a Christian, but you're still enmeshed in the world, you're just like them, it hasn't changed you, and they're not convinced. Now, I want you to think of um, a restaurant for a moment. Let's say you go to a restaurant. Um, this, is the, this is the work that is being done. When you go to a restaurant, if you were to, to be given your drink order, and you notice on the drink, on the cup, there's lipstick, what would you do? What would your reaction be? Waiter, waiter, waiter. That's not my wife's lipstick. She doesn't wear lipstick. Uh, so what's going on here? What, did we get a dirty cup? Uh, you know, and if they, if they have lipstick on this cup, let's say they bring the food out, and that food is just the plate is just covered with dust and mold. Okay, you're saying there's lipstick on the cup, there's dust and mold on the on the plates. What kind of restaurant is this? What kind of restaurant is this? But that is sort of the world's experience of some Christians where you're offering them no salvation at all, no message. Your life is just like them. Why in the world would they be convinced by that? God wants to use a process called sanctification where he goes with us and he begins to cleanse us and, and, and help us to walk anew in him. And so it's like that dish that begins to get washed so that when you're in service, when you're out there and the world sees you and experiences what you're testifying of, they can say, wow, this is amazing, thank you, instead of, lipstick on the on the cup we don't want anything to be a stumbling block for somebody where they they would say that that's not christ-like that's that's not a christian we want to let our lifestyles back up what we testify is true amen now likewise god's reputation his glory is reflected in vessels used for service this is why the scriptures really do uh they focus a lot on sanctification and by and salvation and the works, the fruits that come with it. Because it's not just about your salvation, it's about what you're saying is salvation to others. And it may not be salvation at all if it doesn't affect their lifestyle. So in review, three escapable laws of God's hands. And I'm gonna have the worship team come up. We're gonna close uh, with one more song here. But in, in a review, three escapable laws of God's hands. Number one is that people are designed by God. The potter does what seems best, and you, are, you have a design. Number two, people are shaped by culture. Okay, If you're not being shaped by his hands, you're being shaped by culture. There's no way out of that. You cannot just decide, I'm going to opt out of the world's systems and not be affected by their, their beliefs or values. No, it's the way God's designed it. There's a law at work here that people are shaped by culture. And third, People are signed and sealed by the Lord. It's the Lord's work. And he signs you saying, you are mine, but also he seals you through a work of sanctification. Would you guys stand up? We're going to go into a time of praise and worship, and then I'll close with some application. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you 
for your hand at work in our life, Lord. God, we thank you that you've given us a design that seemed best to you. We trust your judgment. God, we trust, God, your pattern, your design for our life and the lifestyle that you choose for us to live. God, we thank you, God, that you don't leave us to this the, the whims of culture, but you give us an anchor in the word of God and in Christ Jesus. We can see by his example, we can see through your word what truth is a firm foundation for us. And Lord, we thank you that ultimately you, God, sign and seal the work that you've done in us. And God, we want our work to be for honorable use. God, we want to give you glory, God, and reflect back to you and say, this is our God. And I want, we want people to be able to look at our life, God, and be convinced, not be turned away, Lord. So help us, Lord. If there's any way that God is dishonorable in us, Lord, I pray your Holy Spirit would help to sanctify us, to cleanse us, and God, to help us to walk according to your word in the grace you've provided. We thank you for this time together. In Jesus' name, amen. So I want to give you a couple applications here to not leave you, uh, to leave you hanging. There's a few things that you can do here with this message. Number one is to accept God's design. Uh, and if you're struggling against it, you're not accepting it. Struggling, the act of struggling, of doubting and struggle with what, what I've said. If anything is like, real, you're really struggling with it, you need to come to a place of accepting God's design. Don't just accept my word on it. Look at the word of God and accept what God has set for us and for our life. The second thing you can do is to choose your worship. You ultimately get to choose. You can choose the things of this world and the temporary things that satisfy, or you can choose something eternal. You can choose to make God the, the central focus of your life. You get to choose, so make that choice. And number three is to examine yourself. You know, I really believe as you examine yourself, you're going to find something good. Okay, I really believe that. At the end of the day, God wants you to find him. And so, like, like Toy Story, where they looked, at the signature of uh, their owner, God has a way of confirming to you. It's by his Holy Spirit we cry out, Abba, Father. And it's something that can be very reassuring for us. You can also examine yourself that there may be things that, that are not like what he's made for you, that the work that he's doing you is not complete. He wants to continue uh, to work in those areas. You know, I'm included. God is continually working on my speech, my thoughts, and my conduct, my character. And it's something that we need to yield to the potter's hand. Amen? Amen. All right, I'm going to let you guys go with this. Uh, be blessed. Uh, there's registrations. Uh, meet Ashley by uh, the offices. I want you guys to remember Experiencing God is Tuesday, June 7th. If you want to be involved in that, let me know. And then if you want to pick up some flyers, I believe, for the summer cookout, you want to invite some family or some friends, uh, make sure you... Stop by and grab those. It should be just out there in the lobby. God bless you. We'll see you later on in the week.